Major support for Do the Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Bakersfield West Rotary Stroop Family Foundation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, Kern High School District, and AC Electric Company. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Do The Math. I'm Michael. And I'm Scott. And in studio with us, we have Abigail. And Abigail, if somebody wanted to get a hold of us, what would they need to do? They would need to, for math homework, help for help calls in Bakersfield, 636-4357, toll free, 1-866-637-6284. The email for Do The Math is do the math at kern.org. We're online at do the math and on social media Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All right. A lot of ways to get a hold of us, aren't there? Uh huh. All right. Lots Before of ways. we get going, how about if you let everybody know where you go to school and what grade you're in? So I'm in fifth grade and I go to Loudoun Elementary. Home of the Leopards, if I'm not mistaken, correct? <laughs> um, I'm not sure. What, you don't even know the mascot of your school? I mean, it is a leopard, but it's not the home of the leopards. Oh. The den of the leopards? I mean, what do you want? <laughs> but you guys are the loud and leopards. Yeah. All right, let's leave it at that. We agree on that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. How long have you been a leopard? For six years. So ever since kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And how's it going this year? It's going pretty well. Same as every other year, just like pretty well, same as every other year? Mm -hmm. Nothing's different? Well, I mean, except for Zoom. Oh. <laughs> but <laughs> well, that's kind of a big thing, isn't it? I mean, yeah. Are you used to it? Like, are you, are you kind of got the hang of it now? Yeah, we've gotten the hang of it because in, like, for a part of fourth grade, we had to do Zoom. Oh, that's right. Well, you guys yeah. did at the end of the year. You guys were able to do that? Yeah. Okay, good. So you kind of got a head start on some mm -hmm. other people doing that. And how do you like doing assignments, like, at your house through the Zoom? I feel like it's more comfortable. Like, you can't just casually bring your teddy bear or a blanket to school. Right. But, I mean, you could sit in your chair at your desk or at a table or whatever and so do your So it's more work. relaxed. Yeah, it's more relaxed. Okay. Like, you're not as stressed out. All right, like, good. you have all your stuff with you. Nice to hear. Are you, do you eat a lot during your time while you're at the house during doing school? I mean, at lunchtime, of course, but no, like we're not but allowed you don't to like eat snack on Zoom. During... Like we're not allowed to eat during the Zoom calls. How would they know? I'm only kidding. I'm just like, because I was thinking, <laughs> if I'm at home, I'll just sit there and, you know, snack on stuff whenever I can. Yeah. You guys have your video on the whole time? Yeah, we're supposed to have our video on. Oh, good, because I know sometimes with the, uh, the bandwidth, sometimes they have the video off sometimes. Uh, but that's good if you guys are able to have the video on the whole time. It makes things a lot easier, don't you think? Mm-hmm. All right. What kinds of things are you working on in math right now in fifth grade? So right now we're working on um, adding and subtracting decimals. Good. Well, you know what? We're going to do some work with decimals in a little bit. Okay. But first, we're going to take a look at today's Math in the News. All right, today's Math in the News. Always a pleasure when we can actually have somebody in studio with us. And today we've got Sherry Hornbunk from Taft College. How are you today? I'm good. Go what? Cougars. Yeah, there you go. Cougars, right? Cougars, cougars. and leopards. Oh, all of the Cougars. Big cats all over the place. Anyway, Sherry, uh, 
let us know what exactly do you do at Taft College? I run the Taft College Foundation and I went out there about 11 years ago to start it because even though the college had been around for 90 years, they really had not formed up a real philanthropic effort, meaning raising money to build better programs and scholarships. So that's what I've been doing for 11 years. All right, so what, and I know that Taft College has become pretty prominent in the past decade also, in part because of that. I think so, thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm just saying, yeah. I know that there are students from Bakersfield mm -hmm. that travel to Taft to go to Taft College, even though there are schools here. Yes. So there's gotta be a draw of things going on at Taft College that draws them to that well, school. Well, Taft has some special things going on there. I mean, as the town builds out west, Taft College becomes closer to a lot of <laughs> homes because we're just going further west. The other thing is the average classroom size is about 19. So for students that are maybe first generation or a little unsure about what they want to do, they really do get a lot of support and comfort from our professors. Um, and the counselors, and everybody's just kind of handy in one building. There's no parking costs. The campus is small. One cafeteria everybody hangs out in. And we, are, we, are, we do have dorms, which a lot of community colleges don't have dorms, but we have dorms as well. So we're unique um, and we're friendly. And the number one overarching theme that everybody says is we're all like family. So it's okay. very cool. And that's very important. It's very cool. Yeah. Now, speaking of family, families talk all the time, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right? So tell us a little bit about Taft Talks. Okay. Taft Talks was a sort of a thought moment <laughs> at the foundation. We said, now that we're Zooming and we can't really meet with people, what can we do? Our students need to understand what kind of careers are in Kern County. Why? Because we need economic development. We want our students to continue to... If you go to Cal State, perfect. If you transfer to a university somewhere else, that's great. Or even if you just want to go to work right after you get your AA or AS degree. Right. We want you to know what your options are. And we also have great business relationships with people that have internships. So not only are we trying to school and have these TAF talks about career and networking opportunities, we want them to get to know the industries that are out there. It's kind of crazy. The students that have been getting on, they're like, I didn't know we had a GeekWise Academy in <laughs> Bakersfield. I didn't know Era Energy had a gym and had such great benefits. I mean, all of these things are coming out in these conversations. So that's really what it's all about. It's about just sort of letting young people understand that career networking is really important because how many times have you known somebody where you've gotten a job? I know for me, right. I know somebody, you get the job, oh, they, they have a job there, okay. So it's about meeting people and networking. Who you know. Who you know, right. there you go. Well, you know what? You have a student that was at Taft College yes. and moved on and I think we've got a little bit of video right here of the young yeah, lady. Yeah, Myra Reyes. Hello, I'm Myra Reyes Cruz. I came to Kern County from Mexico at the age of 16, knowing no English. I was always concerned about speaking English and I didn't feel ready to attend a four-year university. I decided to enroll at Taft College after high school to be a proficient English so speaker. So let's talk a little bit about yeah. what she's gone through because she obviously moved here, right? Decided to go to Taft she College. Did. She did. She moved here at 16 and went to Shafter High School and her English skills were not proficient and it always bothered her. So she thought she would, but she was very good in math and she always knew it. So she a universal she, language. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. So she did. She got an AA degree, AS degree in mathematics from Taft College, and I met her at the STEM club because they asked me to come in and speak and talk about the Hutchison Engineering Promise program. And she said, that, "Well, wow, they have a contact at Cal." She goes, "I've always wanted to go to Cal Berkeley." Mm -hmm. And I said, "Really?" I said, "Well, your GPA better be 4.0 or higher." <laughs> right. And she goes, "It is." And Paul. Paul Blake, the professor, said she's, she's our best student. So I worked really hard calling up there because we have a relationship with Berkeley when it comes to engineering. So if there are students out there in Kern County that maybe you want to be an engineer, but you're not quite sure you want to jump right into a four-year university, our Hutchison Engineering Program has wraparound services, tutoring, counseling, mentoring, 
we work with you as hard as we can to get you through physics and calc and everything else you need to do. Right, and we can see that. You, we've got a flyer here on yeah. the Hutchinson Engineering Promise. Yes. And the services that you were just referring to and then the program requirements so the students can see those right there. Yes. And this is open to anybody, but to in particular, anybody. you want to get some of the high school students thinking about this right now. Yes, absolutely. In fact, the momentum is incredible. We picked up 12 students this semester and they're from, we've got a couple from Taft High School, but Stockdale, Liberty, Frontier, I mean, they're coming in from all over because our counselors are starting to get the word out. We promise that in two years you will transfer or you will have an engineering degree and you will be debt free when it comes to school costs. There you go. And that is a big promise right there. It's, yeah. Because I know that our children went through, they started at Taft also. They did. Yeah. Went on and graduated four year degrees and are gainfully employed and have no debt. That's excellent. So that was the way to go through. I mean, there was no debt coming out of school yes. and Taft College was a big part of that. Yes, please parents, think of a community college. Doesn't matter which one, there are 116 in California. <laughs> There's one around almost everybody's neighborhood. It's a wonderful way to get your students started. And it's, you can, you can actually pay for a two year degree if you have to pay for everything less than three thousand dollars to get an AA degree. To get half of your school in Half of your school and honestly I've checked books. The books at UCLA for the undergraduates are very similar to what Taft College has. I've checked just because I wanted to know. I was curious. <laughs> right. It's the same. It's pretty much the same. Now is the social life the same? No. Probably not. But, but when you move on to another then you can transfer school, school after that you've got those opportunities. Exactly. Well exactly. you know what Sherry we certainly do appreciate you taking some time coming in and sharing with us first about Taft Talks, mm -hmm. Taft College in general, and then um, also with the engineering program out there and how you have a promise for those students to be able to move on to elite universities Yes, to become uh, engineers. Scott Spielman's son graduated from our program and went on to the Colorado School of Mines this year. Oh, there you go. So they're going far and beyond. Berkeley, Colorado, a lot of places. So. Well, thank you once again. That is today's Math in the News. 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30 this afternoon, but more importantly, we have Abigail. All right, young lady. Are you well rested? Yes. I'm glad to hear that because you're going to do some work right now. All right, so I want you over to the board, young lady. And I am going to get a beautiful problem all set for you. So, have you ever been to a grocery store? Yes. All right. <laughs> Of course I have. You're like, of course I have. What's the matter with you? I've been to a grocery store. All right. Do you do the buying, though, at the grocery store? No. No. But you get to pick stuff out, right? Sometimes. Sometimes. Well, guess what? At some point in your life, you're going to have to do the buying at the grocery store. I know. And wouldn't you like to get the best deal? Would you like to spend the least amount of money or have to pay a lot of money for something that you didn't have to? Spend the least amount of money. Probably the least amount of money, right? So you would like to have a deal, okay? So what you and Scott are going to work on is unit rate right now. And I want you to determine which of these four is the best deal. So these are fruit snacks, okay? So you can get 10 packages for $7.98. Or you can get 38 for $12.69, 40 for $13.45, or 80 for $21.67. Now, just looking at that, are you able to tell which is the best deal as far as the unit rate is concerned? I would say the last one. Why would you think the last one? Because you would get more only for $20. Like okay. You would get $80, not $80, wow, 80 packages of fruit snacks for $21, and that's a lot of packages of fruit snacks. Indeed it is. But I could <laughs> spend only $7.98 and I'm not spending $20. But that's for 10, that's a lot <laughs> less than 80. It is, well why don't you two go ahead, work on this, and then we'll find out what the best unit rate actually is, all right? And I will even let you use a calculator. <laughs> oh, heck of a deal. <laughs> all right, so you and Scott, go to it. All right, Abigail, what do you think? What does this mean, unit rate? What number does the word unit remind you of? Numbers. Which number, specifically? Like any number. 
It could be any number, but is there one specific number that the word unit reminds you of? Um. If you have a unit of something, how many do you usually have? If you had a unit, it would be the amount that you had. Mm -hmm. Sometimes even a place value is called the unit's place. Do you know what place value it is? Yeah. Which place? Well, the place value is, um, well, I know what a place value chart is. Okay. It's where you like put digits. So you know where the tens and the hundreds and the thousands are, yeah. right? Do you know where the unit's place is? The unit's place is in one of the hundreds of tens. <laughs> it's, it could be one of them, but yeah. what, I'm, what I'm shooting for here is the word unit usually refers to one. It's the ones place, the okay. units place. It also, in this case, we're talking about the unit rate. We want to know, we have all those options about how many packages of fruit snacks you can buy. Okay. We really want to know, for each of those deals, how much does one package cost? And in the first example, if we could figure that out, we could compare it to the second example, we could compare it to the third example, and we'd have something to compare because it'd be the same type of deal, okay? okay. So the first one said, I think it was 10 packages for seven ninety eight. dollars is that right? Okay, so if you have 10 packages, right, 10 packages, okay. and the money that you have are going to spend seven uh, ninety-eight, dollars right, something like that. Mm -hmm. We want to know how much it is for one package, right, how much per one package. How do you figure that out? You would have to divide it. Let's do that. Go ahead and pick up your pen there, the black pen, and let's see if you can do that. So show me what would the problem look like if you were going to work this problem out. So what I would, would you divide be between the other numbers? I would say I would divide 10 divided by 7 and 98 cents. <clears throat> 10 divided by 7 98? No, 7 98 <laughs> by 10. And I put it in a little bit of a fraction, and that made you, know, made you go one direction, sure. But we want to know, again, we want to know how much per one package, right? How much money per package. Let me write that down. Maybe that will make it a little bit easier. Over here, we want to know how much money... Money per, ooh, it's hard to write on this board today, per package. Okay. Okay? And so this, the, um, the fraction that I've written for you probably needs to be switched around. Can you write next to it, write the money on top and the 10 packages on the bottom? <laughs> yeah, so we're kind of going to want to flip that around. And so I agree we're going to do some division, no doubt about that. But mm -hmm. let's, divi let's divide exactly the way that you've written instead of the way that I've written it, right? 798 divided by 10. Okay, can you write that problem out next to it? So we have kind of a fraction. So you're going to write 798 divided by 10. You can use a division sign. And then we can go ahead and figure that out on a calculator. That's fine. That'll work. Oh, crap. I forgot that it was a... <laughs> Yep, 798 divided by 10. There you go. All right, so walk on over to that calculator, and let's see what that answer is, okay? What's 798 divided by 10? Tell us how much one package of X is going to be in the first example. Right there. Now, hold on a second. I'm going to interrupt you guys quickly here. Okay. Abigail, what is 3 divided by 1? 3 divided by 1 is 1. I know, 3. 3. Wow. All right. It's What's 18 divided by 1? 18. What is 700 divided by 1? 700. What is 798 divided by 1? 798. Okay. So take a look up there. Okay. Now, it's not 798 divided by 1. It's divided by 10. So imagine that the zero is gone. Okay. All right. What would the answer be? 798. Okay. So go ahead and write 798 up there. As your answer. But there is a zero, so that means we're going to have to move the decimal one place. Do you know which way you're going to move the decimal? To the left. Show me which way you're thinking of. Okay, so what do you think the answer would then be? I would say... So instead of $7.98, what would it be, does it look like? It would be 0 0.798. All right, so let's see if this works when you actually do the calculation now, all right? Or we'll see if we had to go the other way, but we'll see, all right? So use the calculator and put 7.98 divided by 10 
and let God know you. Hmm. I don't know what's that. Oh. What's it say? Zero point seven ninety eight. Nice. Good deal. So go ahead and write that down. Zero point seven nine eight. You can write it right underneath there on the side. Zero point seven nine eight. We just gotta get that in there. There you go. Good. And if you had to make it into money, right? Usually money, as far as the change part, doesn't have three places. It only has two places. Yeah. So what really is that going to be as far as how much money it costs? So. Can you do a little rounding for us? So if 100 cents equals one dollar, then 700 cents would equal seven dollars. And not, I'm not quite shooting to go that direction. I just want you to get rid of the eight because we don't like the eight there. Okay, so we have 79 cents, but we have that 8 hanging on the end. Can you round the 9 using the 8? Does the 8 round the 9 up or the same? It rounds it up. It rounds it up. So can you round that up for us? So you can leave it just like that, okay? In fact, we'll ne right next to it, I'm going to write these little squiggly equal signs because that means approximately. Mm -hmm. So after that, what would it round to? 0.798 rounds to what? It would be... How much money? It would be... 71. You told me that 8 rounds the 9 up, right? Okay. okay. Not rounds the 9 up to what? That rounds it up to a 10. Up to a 10. That's right. But you don't have room to put a 10 there. So, so you can put a 0 there and the 1 would carry over to the 7, right? A whole bunch of rounding going on here. So let's see if we can make that into a number that we can use as far as just two places, right? The 0 would stay the same. What would the 7 become? It would become an 8. That's right. Good job. And then you said that the 9 round up to a 10, and there would just be an 8, right? Or, sorry, a 0. So the 0.798 really is pretty darn close to 80 cents. 80 cents mm -hmm. for one package. Okay. So do the next one and see if we get a better deal. Mm -hmm. All right, what is the next one? Do you so, remember how much it cost for, oh, was it 20 packages? So the next one you have, uh, 12.69. Okay, so we got 12.69. Go ahead. <laughs> Oh, 0.69? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Twelve dollars and sixty-nine cents, right? For thirty-eight packs. Ooh, thirty-eight packages. Thank goodness for that calculator, huh? Yep. All right, what do you got? Let's go ahead and punch that in there. And I wrote the eighty cents on the side, so we don't forget what the first deal was. Okay. And I've got it written up here also, in case you guys <laughs> delete your screen for some reason. And remember, you can use the calculator. Oh, you've got it already. Good. Uh oh, eyes got like big there. Wrong. Must be a good number. I feel like that's wrong. What did you get? It says 0 0.3339473. Wow. Well, the, the feeling can, can be part of the problem sometimes. So if you had 0 0.33, try it again one more time just to make sure. Right, I was going to say, because sometimes you want to make sure that you're putting everything in correctly. So make right. sure you clear the calculator. Come here, I'll help you with this, because <laughs> if it's that? a new calculator, it's you might be like, where is everything? All right, so this is clear. Okay. okay. All right, so I just do it a couple of times, right? Okay. So go 1269. And then what are you going to divide it by? I'm going to divide it by 38. Okay. And what do you get now? Same Let's answer. See. All right, so... You're going to go ahead and write it up there. I'm glad we checked it. So write your decimal <laughs> up there and go three places. Three so places. zero point. Go ahead, put your zero. Zero point what? Zero point. Three, three, three. There you go. Good. There's three places. Now, if we were going to round that, again, we only want two places. Okay. The very last three that you see there, right? The very last one. Mm -hmm. This one right here. Does that, does that round the other three? It's going to help you round that one. Does that round the other three up or the same? Keep the same. Keep the same. All right. Or so you let it rest. how much is it going to be per package for that deal? So 33 cents. 33 cents. That's it. Yeah. And that's not very much at all. That's a, no. a lot better deal than we got before. 33 cents. What's the next one? We got to see if we get a better deal the more we buy. 
no. <laughs> there you go. All right, thirteen dollars and forty-five cents. Thirteen forty-five. Thirteen forty-five. And that is for forty packs. Good. Packs. There you go. Talk later, time. <laughs> Myself. Thirteen point forty five mm -hmm. divided by forty equals wow, it's a lot less number a than lot the last. Less. All right, write it up there, right? The three places. <laughs> zero point zero point three three six. Oh, interesting. All right. So if you had to make that one into two places so that I can write it down over here. Okay. Zero point, what would it be? The six rounds the three to a what? So the six, if it's five or more, mm -hmm. you borrow from the six. We don't need to borrow, but well, the, if it's borrow. five or more, it's important to know exactly what yeah. to do, yeah. That's kind of an interesting way to look at it, though. What so would it change the three to? It would change it to a four. Aha, 0 0.34. So even though you got more packages, that ends up being a little bit less of a deal, right? Not quite so good. All right, the last one. This was your guess. This was the one you thought was going to be the best deal. So we're looking for the lowest price, even though we have to have a little bit of extra money on the beginning part of this problem, right? You have to have a little bit of money to shell out at the beginning to buy a bunch of fruit snacks, but you can hopefully get a better deal. Let's see what those last numbers are. Twenty-one sixty-seven. Twenty-one dollars and sixty-seven cents. <laughs> That's a three. Twenty-one. 67. 67. And this is for 80 packs. Or so. Ooh, calculator time. <laughs> calculator time. That's it. 21.60 versus 7. <laughs> 21. Divided by. Six, seven, divided by 80. Good 80. deal. Your guess is it's going to be less than 33 cents. Shoot. I the wrong number. Put a decimal at the end of the 80 <laughs> instead of pressing the equal sign. 21.67 divided by 8 equals. Ooh, different numbers, but All still right. kind of long. Write it down. See what you got. Three places. 0. Point. 0. Point 0.270. Aha. 0 0.270. I'm pretty sure that's going to be the least expensive. If you had to make it into two places, what would it be? It would be 27. 27. So the best deal, just like you said, per individual one package of fruit snacks is the biggest possible package you could buy. Mm -hmm. Got to have a bunch of money to buy it at first, but it's the best deal overall. There nice you go. work. Nicely done, you guys. Great. Some great work right there. And Abigail, because you've done some great work right there doing decimals for the first time with unit rate, You've got yourself a meal courtesy of our friends at Chick-fil-A. So congratulations on that. So one quick question before uh, we move on. Okay. If you had to get 80 packs of fruit snacks, what flavor would you like? Um, I'll go with the original Welch's. <laughs> All right, there honest. you go. That's what the young lady likes. Hey, we'll be back with more right after this. Well, today we're at another Bakersfield favorite, Dwarves Fine Candies, a family tradition for over 100 years. We're going to take a look at the sweet side of science as we take a look at the candy making process from beginning to end. I've got Christian with me and we're ready to go check it out. You ready? Yep. Let's go. Continuing with the sweet side of science, today we're at Dwarves. We've got Christian with us, a student at Buena Vista Elementary School, and Jose. And Jose, you've been with Dwarves for about 19 years now, right? Yes. And what is your role here? You are the master candy maker? At yeah, candy, candy maker. Candy maker? Yeah. Well, you know what? We'd like to see the science behind the making of the famous Dwarves candies. So what do you say we head back to the kettles, get all the ingredients together, and get this thing underway? Yeah. All right, let's head back. So 
So these are the ingredients from the very start? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Right. It's 15 pound rolls. Eh? And is that just sugar? Yeah, sugar, right? Years ago. Yeah, this we did. Corn we soda. The first talk about electricity. The yeah. Should I save you one? Bigger right. spoon over here. What does a corn syrup do to the candy? Like, what is the ingredients? The ingredient, you know, this sugar and this is corn soda. Bit. This salt for the flavor. Okay. Now I will pour it over there in the number number one, Kero number one. Does this kind of, does this just add flavor to the yeah, candy? Yeah. You wanna you wanna test it? It's okay. <laughs> okay. Pour it in here. So now I put the marshmallow and I put a, another ingredient that says half fat. It's, a, it's one pound and a half. Oh, what does that do to the candy? This is for the flavor. This is half fat. It's like, like oil. Okay, uh, so you've got an oil going in there. Yeah. We mix it all. And what is the temperature this needs to get to? 252 degrees. And how much marshmallow product is in there? Uh, we put six pound marshmallow. So this is liquid, you know. So now with the marshmallow is over happy, you know, we mix it out. This is almost ready, you know, to pour in the table. If you need some help, I've brought a worker here for you. So you yeah, can yeah. Help <laughs> here, you can start mixing yeah, up. Yeah, we put this flavor over here. This is this is vanilla. So the vanilla's in there next, and Christian will go ahead and get that vanilla mixed up in there while he gets his workout going. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> it's a lot thicker than I thought. <laughs> so it feels really thick as you're doing that? Yeah. Probably because of the marshmallow. Marshmallow making it thick, and then that vanilla, we can see it starting to get all mixed in there. Yeah, Christmas time, we make it like 50 batches. How many batches? 50. How's it looking, Jose? Is he getting it in there pretty good? Uh, almost ready, almost ready. <laughs> now, how long does this need to continue getting mixed? The pan is almost sometimes three minutes, four minutes. Sometimes the, the, the marshmallow is hard, so it's more hard to mix it out. It's almost almost ready, you know. Now, do you want it? Do you want the consistency to be totally smooth? Where he's got to get some of the lumps out, or is it all right? Yeah, you see those lumps, the, the bo so we need it. Everything is like like liquid, you know. Like. We're gonna keep Christian working, or we gonna? <laughs> uh, we mix it out. Just give it. There, Jose will take over for you there. Man, he makes it look easy. <laughs> well, he's been doing it for a little longer too. Yeah. So. Working for almost 19 years. Over here. 19 years? Yeah. Marshmallow, no, it's just all oh, this. Okay, this is ready. I make sure you know the fruit candy. It's got everything in it. Yeah. Uh, nothing like the sweeter side of science other than the tastier side of science right there. Mm -mm -mm. In studio with us, we've got Tom Henderson. And Tom, you and I, we met many years many ago. Many years ago. You yes. were on the show as part of uh, AC Electric. Right. Talking to us about electricity about and electricity. how we apply math to that and stuff like yes. that. Yes. Over the years, this has grown into a different type of relationship. Sure. You are, let's say, the man as far as Kern Robotics goes, right? 
Well, I, yeah, I guess so. There that, you go. That, so that, I, I will take that. Tell us a little <laughs> bit about Kern Robotics. Well, we started about 10 years ago, 9, 10 years ago, uh, building robots uh, for competition. And uh, that evolved from six teams then to now we have up over 150 teams in Bakersfield. And it was big so, last year on Do the Math. It was big last year on Do the Math. That was a whole new concept for us. So, so was what great. was going on last year? We got cut short a little bit, but we got cut short with the COVID. You know, we started uh, we started doing the robot rumble, and uh, it was going great guns. We had four teams. Oh, there it is. We had four teams set up for finals, and uh, then we got shut down. So, uh, do you know the four teams? Yes, we do. Uh, I had Rosedale Middle School made it, uh, Rio Bravo Greeley. Curran Junior High and Chipman Junior High made it into the finals. All right, so we can see some of the footage right there from yes. last year's competitions. Right. And on the desk right now. On the desk. We've got an unveiling to do. That's right. So let's, uh, you know yeah, what? Let's, let's, let's do it. Take this. And what were they all battling for? Yes, they were battling for the Robot Rumble Cup. There you and go. And unfortunately... We still have it to give away. But you know what? We're looking to give yeah. it away soon. We don't want this thing in here very long. I this mean, is true. We want that at a school. Right, we do. And uh, we might even be working on a way to do that. There you go. Well, you know what? I think you've brought somebody from one of the schools. We so did. why don't you let us know who you've got in the studio okay. with us? I've got Colin Smith, who's the coach from Centennial High School, a good friend of mine. Uh, and he brought a Clawbot robot, and he's going to demonstrate how it works. All right, Colin, all yours. All right, so what do, you, what do you know about robotics? So I've played with a snap circuit board before, um, and it's pretty fun. Uh, like there are different songs on there that you can do, like the happy birthday one, worship cries or whatever. Nice. It's really nice. So you have the similar thing here. We have our power source, just a battery, and it plugs into, this is called the cortex. This is the brain of the robot. Okay. All the other motors that are part of the robot that are on the drive, that are on the arm, that are on the hand, those are controlled by this brain. Okay. So every year, kids start with a similar set of parts. This is what's called a clawbot kit, but you can take the parts and rearrange them any way you want, and then you program it so that it contacts from the brain to the controller. So it has okay. this little key that goes back and forth between those two. So it can kind of talk, and then it can accomplish different things. And the kids, instead of having it like a, you know, an Xbox or a PlayStation where the controller just does what somebody else has programmed, mm -hmm. you program what it does. So it has all the buttons. You decide what you want the buttons to do, uh, what, you're, what that, that's going to do to play whatever the game is. Last year, there were things with cubes. Uh, here's an example of different cones. Uh, these stack on top of each other. So you can see the, 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 the goal that year was to get them as, as high as possible, score as many points okay. as you could. Um, but you need something that can grab onto it. So you have the claw, which can open up and close and grab them, the arm that can lift, so you can stack them on there. So what we've got here is just one of the basic robots, and you'll be able to play the same way uh, the students do. So if you have the controller, I'll uh, turn this on here. So there's a switch on the back that says it's on off right now. See if you can switch it to on right there. Oh. Right to there. So see the little lights going? They're starting to pair. So I'm going to set this down here so it doesn't drive off the table. And we'll look at a couple of these things here. So what you can do is the controller to drive, okay. you're going to be using this joystick. So forward, backwards, left, uh, right, left. And then there are these buttons on the, the top. This controls the claw, open and closed, and this controls the arm, up and down. I think I've got that right. I may have had it backed up. So what you can do is you can kind of go around the table here a little bit so you can see how to drive the robot. Just practice driving it a little okay. bit. So I'll go, the more you, the more you move it, the more you, you go with it. You can kind of make it turn however you want it. And then if you want to open or close the claw, you can pick up those yellow cones. So it's just getting used to it. Takes a little bit of uh, driving. The heavier one, uh, you're not going to be able to pick it up with this robot. But there were people who could redesign and build a robot, kind of using the basic engineering process to figure out 
how to do that. OK. So now, if you use those top buttons, so that opens it, and the bottom one closes it. So you can open it back up, get a wider view, and drive up to it. OK, go a little bit further. A little, all right, so looks like you got it. So you can now lift it. So now you can turn it around. So you turn the other way, or whichever way there. And go back up. Let's be on this side. Oh, yeah, close it. Yeah, close it back there. Just, you know, you haven't practiced with it like the kids who are at the, it will be at the Robot Rumble. Um, the other, yeah. Now see if you can stack it, almost. So, but you're just trying to, you're sending that signal from the, the controller to the brain and it controls the robot. So you're building, there's that circuit, all the wires have to be connected, everything has to be ready to go. And so the kids practice for hours to get good at uh, controlling the robot, knowing what the robot's going to do. And going oh, it's that. really so close. close. So close. And if you're ahead of some of my students this year. Um, let's see. Let's see if, can, if you go up high enough, it'll stay up. Oh, or stay, uh, keep there you going. go. Slam it the <laughs> other oh, way. No. We'll stack it. So you can bring it. Just, just pull the stack arm back. It. It'll go. Can adjust it. There we go. Okay. And you just kind of see, try and try and line it up. This is it's always the hard part. That's why uh, how we get the teams. They're they're working together, trying there to accomplish oh, this. Right. And so you got it. So just after a couple of minutes, she's already mastered it. She'll she'll be ready uh, once Loudon decides to have their own robotics team. They'll have, they'll know who to look for, and so you can go around, try and grab another one, or just drive around in circles, see kind of how you can move it. And so that's the basics. Once you've built the robot, the team works together. They have to to uh, drive it, come up with strategies how they're going to go uh, head to head if they're going to. Uh, be aggressive, if they're going to play defense, if they're going to play office. All of that, they get to design and decide what they're going to do. It's all that design process that we try and teach them over and over. Uh, in, so I've got uh, a question for you, Colin. Yes. Is there a limit on the number of students that can be on a team? Um, there's no limit. Um, there's kind of a practical limit. The, the minimum is one. The biggest that I've ever had is six on a given robotics team. Like at Centennial, it's a very popular program, so I have nine teams, Okay. Uh, so about 50 students are, who are involved in it because we've been successful and they see the benefit of it. And, their and is this something the that the students can partake during school or is it strictly after school? Um, it, depending on the school. Oh. Several of the schools have it like Centennial during the school day. We actually have a zero period class. The kids get up extra early to be a part of robotics. Um, it's a little harder to do now but we, we've been able to have a lot of kids doing that. Uh, but most schools, it's an after-school program. So their, their teachers are giving up their time, and the, the kids who are you know, bringing, bringing uh, the same thing you bring to a sport. You come and you practice, you design, you work together and come up with uh, those competitions on weekends. And have you had any students that were part of the robotics team at Centennial and have moved on and incorporated yeah. that somehow later? Yes, um, but one of my first group of students, they just have just graduated college right now. Uh, the first group, our first year, we were able to qualify for the world championship. And one of the young ladies in that team is working in cybersecurity. She's uh, worked with the FBI. Yeah, another one is working at an aerospace firm down in San Diego. So they've just graduated college and they're, uh, they've you know, come back and participated again with some of our students, but they've been able to use those skills going forward. Great. Well, it sounds like a lot of fun. I know that uh, the robotic rumble has been a big hit, especially with Do the Math and a lot of the schools. Sure. Uh, so, Tom, yes. what do you think is the Pretty next curious. step we've got going on is trying to get this trophy to one of the schools? We're coming up with some plans that might uh, allow us to keep socially distanced and, uh, and bring back the Robot Rumble maybe early or late this year, early next year. All right, if there are schools that have not done anything with robotics right. and they would like to, they would like to start, mm -hmm. is there some place they can go to to start? 
Well, there's uh, the VexRobotics.com website that has all the information you'd ever want to know about robotics. Okay. Uh, or the robotics competition. A lot of the schools here in town have the project lead the way, um, and that allows uh, that uses the same platform, uh, which is how we got so many teams so quickly. All right. Well, you know what? I know that students absolutely love it. Abigail, is that the first time you've worked with a robot like that? Yeah. How was it? That was pretty good, right? You really mastered fun. it quite well That's in right. a, a short amount of time right there. Yeah. So, Colin, thank you for coming in from Centennial High School. Tom, thank you for coming in from AC Electric My and pleasure. Kern Robotics. Yes. And we'll be back with more right after this. It may look like a plant, but it's actually an animal. Let's see what happens when we touch it. It feels kind of sticky, like Velcro. Those little flowery parts are actually tentacles. And that's what they use to catch their food. They have little tiny stinging cells like tasers. And they inject these cells into their prey and that paralyzes them long enough for the anemone to swallow them. They don't have teeth though. Their food just dissolves inside them. Why doesn't it sting when I touch it? Because our skin is too thick and so we don't actually feel it. But if you touch it to your lip, you can, because the skin's a lot thinner there. This animal is called a feather duster worm, or a tube worm, because it builds a tube-like shell that it can hide in if it gets frightened or needs to hide from predators. Buffalo's cool net helped us catch a bunch of plankton. Plankton means drifter. These are tiny versions of plants and animals drifting in the ocean. And the net is able to be thin enough to let water out, but keep the plankton in it. So here we get to see a bunch of tiny little, they almost look like flecks of dust, uh, swimming around inside of this jar. And these plankton could be baby animals that we could, would recognize the adults of, like sea anemones or sea stars, um, or they could just stay tiny their whole lives. But the fact is, is that when they're tiny, they're usually food. In these two containers, we have a few marine animals that are not plankton anymore. They've gotten to the young adult stage. This creature here, is called a kelp crab. And if you turn it over and look, you can see that it's got little tiny pinchers. It's also got spikes on its legs so it can climb. And if you look underneath here, you can see where there used to be a tail. And that's how you can tail the males from the females. And there you can see the gills. And that's what it used to breathe underwater. 
In this corner over here, we have a small fish called a sculpin. It will eventually get up to maybe six or seven inches long, but it was also plankton when it was first born. In this container, we have one of my favorite marine animals. It's called a nudibranch. Nudibranch means that its lungs or its gills are on the outside of its body, unlike humans who have theirs on the inside. And in this corner over here, we have a decorator crab. And it loves to put things on its body to disguise itself. You notice how it walks sideways instead of forward? Wow, we got to see so many cool creatures while we were down here. It was really fun to learn about all these guys and maybe you want to do some more learning too. Maybe there's an ocean animal that you want to do research on. Keep learning! And we can always keep learning because there's an endless supply of cool creatures in the ocean. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30 this afternoon, as we do most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year. In studio, we have Abigail, a fifth grade student from Loudoun Elementary, home of the Leopards. Mm -hmm. And you're working on decimals. So over to the board, young lady. <laughs> and I want you to write this problem out horizontally. Do you know what that means? Mm -hmm. In like a straight horizon. line across. Perfect. 361. Point three one minus two point eight four one. So this is one of the problems off of your homework assignment sheet. And what I'd like you and Scott to do is explain how to do this correctly. Okay. So I'd say that I would start out by rounding it to like the same place value as, well, I would say like, I don't think we've worked on that one before. So, but so what your first idea was a wonderful idea. We want like both of these it. numbers to have the same number of decimal places. Yeah. That's a great idea. I like that a lot. When you <coughs> subtract decimals, what do you have to do when you, when you put them in, this is written horizontally, what about when you write them vertically? What do you have to do there? So you have to like borrow from different place values. Mm -hmm. So if it's a smaller number, but that how do you write it? Can it you down. can you write this problem um, vertically? vertically? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Aha! And I mean, you're getting to exactly what we need to talk about a little bit here. So you've moved the two all the way over so that the decimals line up. Mm -hmm. Wonderful idea. We definitely have to do that every time. When you're adding, subtracting decimals, you've got to line up those decimals. So wouldn't it be wonderful if that top decimal had the same number of decimal places that the bottom decimal has? That'd be great, right? Is there a way that you can, well, <clears throat> the, you have your decimal is, is decimal 3-1. What is the number, even though we can't see it, what is the number that's after the one? It would be a zero. That's it. Why don't you go ahead and put it there? Well, look at that. Now they both have the same number of decimals, right? Mm -hmm. And you haven't changed the value, and you haven't changed the problem. You've mm -hmm. just kind of changed how that number looks a little bit for your own benefit, which is exactly what you need to do when you're subtracting decimals. Do you think you can go about solving this problem now? Mm-hmm. All right. Let's see what you can do. Ah, a couple zeros in the front, too. Good idea. So you can't do zero minus one, so it looks like you're doing some borrowing, right? Walk us through this. So Hold on, where did the nine come from? Huh? Just talk, tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Where did the nine come from? Okay, so the nine would come from the ten, which you borrowed from the one. Mm -hmm. So one and zero would, the, right. would equal ten, and so ten minus one equals nine. Good, okay, so then, now the problem you're trying to do is zero minus four, right? Mm -hmm. Can't do that either. What are you going to do okay. next? you got to borrow from the 3. Or so borrowing. So 3 is going to the 2. Okay. And so you're going to turn that 0 into a 10. And then Good. you're going to subtract that by 4, which would equal 6. Okay. Then you can't subtract 2 by 8. All right. So you're going to borrow again. And you're going to put a 0 there. You're going to borrow from the 1. 
and it's going to equal a 12. And so 12 minus 8 equals 4. Wonderful. I'm going to bring the decimal down. Uh, I like how you put the decimal down. <laughs> and 0 minus 2, you can't do that, so you're going to have to borrow from the 6, which would turn into a 5, turn that 0 into a 10, then you can subtract that, which would equal 8. 5 minus 0 equals 5. Three Finally, we didn't have to borrow. Three. Nice. Can you tell me what this number is? <laughs> so it would be 358.469. Uh-huh, 0.469, that's it. Do you know how to say this number by using the correct decimal place value? So in other words, what is the place value where the 9 is? The place value where the 9 is would be... Let's start from the decimal. What is the place value of the 4? The place value of the 4 would be the... Tenths. Tenths, that's right. Good for you. What about the six? Hundreds. Hundreds. And so that means the nine is in? The thousands, please. The thousands. So if you were going to say this, this number, 358, you use the word and for yeah, a decimal, and, and 469,000. That's it. Well okay. done. So you not only do you do the subtraction part, but we've actually said it mathematically correct. Mm -hmm. There well you done. go. All right. Erase the board, young lady. This one I want you to do in your head. Okay. What is 32 divided by 8? 4. 4. Very good. Now on the board, put 3.2 divided by 8. So you know 32 divided by 8 was 4. So now work on this problem, and I will give you 90 seconds. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to put like three. Oh, oh. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> 32 I've got to put a decimal there. I'm just going to write it like this because I feel comfortable. Okay. Like that. And so So what is 32 divided by 8? What was that answer? 4. 4. Once you write the 4 down, then we can worry about the decimal and where that goes, right? So you know the answer is going to be mm -hmm. some form of 4, right? Mm -hmm. And before, when we did the problem, you moved the decimal. So which direction mm -hmm. do you think the decimal needs to go? Well, first of all, where's the decimal on the four that well, you have written right here? At the end. It is at the end. And where does it need to be? It needs to be right here. That's it. Yeah, there you go. So you've moved it one place to the left. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about 3.2, it's like 32 with the decimal moved one place to the left. Mm -hmm. There nice you job. go. Nicely done. And you finished that in less than the 90 seconds hey. a lot. So, Erase the board, young lady. Come on over here real quick. All right. So I've got a very important question for you. What? Did you have fun today? Yes. Good. That's the first one. Did you learn anything new today? Yeah. Ooh, excellent. Bonus day for young Abigail. <laughs> hey, don't forget, we have phone tutors available until 530 this afternoon. And until we meet again, continue to do the math. Major support for Do the Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Bakersfield West Rotary Stroop Family Foundation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, Kern High School District, and AC Electric Company, with additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California.